be in the Lord's house tonight. Uh, appreciate those that uh, was visiting with us this morning. And as always, we welcome our group, our chat groups that join and watch live streaming. We welcome them to the service tonight. And uh, good to see Sister Verna McLeod here tonight. Bless her heart. She's been through a rough time. And it's, it's good to see her in the Lord's house with us. Let's stand up, take the church hymnal. Turn to page number 120, page 120. Call the victorious life. Good to have you tonight. If you're here visiting first time, we'd like you to raise your hand and we'll give you a card, let you fill it out, drop in the plate. All right, have some folks here in the center, one back here in the back, some folks over here. We want to make yourself at home. Good to have you. 
Now, you folks right here are from Washington State. Amen, folks. But as far as you can get, unless you're going to, to uh, Alaska, and uh, we're glad to have them with us tonight. You folks up here, where you all from? New Tazewell. New Good. Good to have you. Amen. And back here in the back. Yes, sir. Louisiana. All right. Well, good. Pray for the folks there in Florida, folks. Milton's bearing down on them now. It's a thing you can't imagine after what, what people have just gone through. Here comes another one. Amen. All right, brother. <laughs> Thank you. 
let's stand up tonight, fellowship, shake hands with our visitors as the choir comes down. Folks, y'all go ahead and be seated. We'll have the ushers come up here. We'll take up the evening offering. Folks, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. I meant to mention this this morning. Tammy Garcia's son has passed away. It's her youngest son in California. And I think this Tuesday she plans to go out there. So please remember her in prayer. This is just, un, you know, unexpected, out of the clear blue, and he passed away. So you can imagine how she feels tonight. Remember her in prayer, please, Tammy Garcia. All right, let's uh, let's pray. Brother Barry, Mike Barry, lead us in prayer, please.
Michelle Keaton's going to sing for us tonight. tonight. You pray for him as he comes up here. Next Sunday, Cody Shue's going to be with us. 
October the 13th, Brother Cody Shu, good preacher, will be cooking that day, so we look forward to having him in here. Hey, brother. Amen. Amen. All right, it's always an honor and a privilege to get up here and to preach. I thank Pastor for giving me another opportunity to get up here. It's, I don't take it lightly. Um, it's a nerve-wracking thing to get up here and preach behind this pulpit. I'm sure many of men that have been up here understand that. So, I do, But I do appreciate you all and uh, appreciate this church and um, how faithful that you all are. And uh, it's been a real blessing to me and my family. And uh, hopefully we can be a blessing to you tonight. So if you will, open your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Let's look at verse 9. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 9, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Brother Sam Green, would you open us up, please, in prayer? Amen. Thank you, brother. I find it interesting every time that um, sometimes messages kind of go together. And Pastor preached on Isaiah 61 this morning, and we're and he's preaching. He preached the message about doctrine, and we're going to be preaching a message here in a moment about doctrine. Um, it's it's always amazing to me how that works. Uh, but uh, just some back, background historical information here about Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah prophesied in a time from about 760 BC to about 698 BC. Which means that Isaiah, when he prophesied, he got to see Israel go off into captivity by the, the ten northern tribes, that is, went off into 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. So what Isaiah got to see when he preached was a, was a nation that was fully into apostasy. And so he, he witnessed certain things that took place in his day. And so God sent a man down by the name of Isaiah as he did all the prophets to preach to a nation and turn them back to God. And so Isaiah preached here and he says, to whom, whom shall... He make to understand doctrine, and you have to understand doctrine is how that the, the Lord chooses to build some things in the Bible and build up Christians, and this title of this message is going to be called God's Building Program, and as we get into the message, we'll understand more of that, but it's, it's funny the day and age that you live in because people want, Paul says this, for the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, uh, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, okay, and they shall tear, turn away their ears from the truth, and I know you've heard that that preached many a times, but it's, it's interesting how that you look at the time of Isaiah's day and the time of our day, and the same things correlate, and Isaiah's here preaching to a bunch of people who are a bunch of drunkards, who have taken the words of God and they've cast them behind their back, and they no longer believe that what God says is true, that, he's not, that he, what he said is going to come to pass literally, and so you're living in the same kind of a day and age in which Isaiah lived in, and so uh, he wasn't exactly the most popular preacher, as all of the Lord's prophets were not that popular. Okay, and I'll just say this, if you're that popular, folks, then you're probably doing something wrong if you're not making some enemies when you go out and preach. And John Wesley was telling my wife this this morning, every time he would go out and he would preach, or his boys would go out and preach, and they'd come back to him, and they'd a he'd ask him two questions. He said, anybody get saved? And they'd say no. And he'd say, okay, did anybody get mad? And they say no. And he said, well, then you have been called to preach. All right, so it's not exactly the greatest office in the world as far as Old Testament prophets because many of these men were stoned and were ridiculed for what they did for God. But because any time you take this, the stand of God on this side and his doctrines against the world, they're not going to like what you have to say very much. And so we see that in the, in the time of, that we're living in, that the doctrine is not exactly a, a, a popular message to preach on. Um, if you don't know by now, I'm pretty... Um, uh, I, I enjoy doctrine. I enjoy teaching it. I think it is the bedrock. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. And without doctrine, you don't know where you're at. Now, I was told one time that, uh, you know, preaching doctrine is dry. You can't preach too much of it because it's dry. Well, I beg to differ. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. 
Let's look at the first time that word ever shows up in your Bible. Look at Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1. It says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. He says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. So you can see, doctrine is not a dry thing. Matter of fact, it's a wet thing. And he likens it to rain coming down and watering his pleasant plants. And Israel was to be that pleasant plant, or I'm sorry, uh, the vineyard. Israel was the vineyard and Judah was the pleasant plant, as you'll read about in Isaiah chapter 5. And so that doctrine, they were to have good doctrine, and they had good doctrine, but they cast it behind their back. And because of that, they produced wild grapes when they were supposed to produce grapes. And you see that today in Christians. You see they are supposed to be producing good fruit, yet they're, they're producing bad fruit. You wonder why there's so many different denominations and people believe this and people believe that because they're not founded on the truth. They're not founded on the truth of the Bible. They don't have their doctrines correct. For instance, somebody get, might get up and quote you something out of Matthew 25 and talking about you. if you've done this to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Who's heard that? That's all well and good. That's fine. But listen, that has nothing to do with you in the church age. What that does is it creates a works-based salvation, which all the Roman Catholics and all the cults love because man has a part in his own righteousness. See, but Jesus Christ is the only righteousness that you have. Amen. Preachers talked about it many a times. He was the only, he was a new righteousness that showed up that would, did not exist before. Right. But it sounds good, and if you cannot rightly divide the word of truth, you don't understand doctrine, what you're going to do is you're going to create cults. And you're going to create these false doctrines, and people go after that stuff because why? It sounds good to the ears. After their own lust, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Yeah. You understand that, right? So every man is drawn away after his own lust, and he's enticed. So back in Isaiah's day, they had a lot of these uh, so-called prophets that would come and they would prophesy and they would say smooth and good things to the king. They're not preachers. Just like Micaiah, when he went over there and preached over to Ahab, he said, I hate that guy. He never has nothing good to say. He was too negative. Well, Ahab, if you'd get right, he'd speak some smooth words to you. But until you get right, he's not going to speak anything good to you because he's got nothing good to say to you. Because you will not, you refuse to listen to the words of God, and he's doing that as, as, as a father chastens his own son. But because Ahab and the rest of Israel would not listen to the living words of the living God, they went into complete apostasy. And because of that, and Judah was later, and because of that, God cast him into the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar came in, and he destroyed Jerusalem. Now, you're living in a day and age that we are, Pastor talked about this morning, you're at the precipice of falling off that cliff in this nation. Amen. I think everybody could agree with that. And so we see that here. You see that he's got, he said, my doctrine. So if the Lord said my doctrine, there's obviously a counterfeit to another doctrine, that false doctrine. All right. So you'll notice in the word of God and you'll study the Bible that if God has a plan, Satan has a counterfeit for that plan. All right. So he says a little here, a little there. Notice how Satan does a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Just a little bit leavens the whole lump. We talked about this before, I think, maybe in Sunday school, but talking about that leaven, where it comes from, it comes from mixing wheat flour with mold. And you'll notice back over there, and if you study your Old Testament in Joshua, he made a covenant with some men who feigned as if they were somebody else in Joshua chapter 9. And those Gibeonites, they feigned as if they came from a far country, but they were their neighbors. And what they brought in with them, they brought in with them that moldy bread. There's a type of your false Bibles along with its false doctrines that come in with them. And they come in amongst you and they act like they're your, well, we're from way over here, but really they're your next door neighbors and they're seeking to infiltrate and to bring that false doctrine in with them. And what that does is it takes a nation and it destroys that nation. You, just like, uh, for instance, Marxism, communism, Fabian socialism, okay? How that that thing works is the same way. It's just a little here and a little there. And eventually, over time, they infiltrate certain organizations within your country, whether it's your school systems, whether it is your religious, uh, your seminaries, all those kind of uh, areas, the religious sector and the secular sector, and they, re and they infiltrate that thing, and they're called change agents. All right? And they begin to, over time, they begin to leaven that whole lump. And so what you're seeing now in this nation is that complete, full-blown, you now you have full-blown Marxism that is running for office, and I'm not getting political, I'm just telling you the facts. 
Okay, that is nothing more than, than Marxism. And it's a very dangerous leaven. But notice how Satan, he does things a little here, a little there. All right, so that's, that's Satan's counterfeit to what the Lord is trying to do to build a Christian. Let's look at the text, though. Look at uh, Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah 28. So I'm going to give you some points here in, in the Scripture, and hopefully it, it helps you. He says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, so these are no longer babes. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So you see the first point, he starts small. The Lord does things small. You're living in a day and age, folks, where everything, everybody's looking for the next big thing. Just like in Paul's day. They were always wanting to hear something new, some new things. Next, what's the next big thing? And unfortunately, in Christianity, it's really no different. People are really not willing to put in the sweat equity it takes to, be, to grow as a Christian. I've, I've been to many a tent meetings now, and I've seen the big tents, and the, like preacher talking about this morning, the big singers and the big preachers, and all that stuff, and that's all well and good in its proper place. But I did notice when I, when I had seen those things, I did not see any difference after the emotions were gone and the shouting and all that stuff, which there's nothing wrong with that, but after all that was gone, I did not see any difference as far as the moral character of the congregation. I did not see any difference more as far as their interest in the Word of God. There was none of that. It was the same old that it was before. It was nothing more than a Christian pep rally, but boy, we had a good time. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is that is not how the Lord does things. He does things with small things. Little here, little there. You look at the building blocks of the universe and what does God use? He uses a little particle called an atom. And one stacked upon another, upon another, eventually becomes something large. But it starts out microscopic and you cannot see that little small thing that God chooses to use to create his universe. And so, there, so the same thing goes for a Christian. When you are looking at little small things that you do in your life that nobody else sees, but the little things that you stack upon one another. And eventually, over time, those things become something big. You take anybody's ministry who's lasted any amount of time, it started small, but eventually that thing grew. And if it was grown right from the Lord, it will last. You'll see this uh, small inputs over a long period of time produce lasting results. I'll say that again. Small inputs over a long period of time produce lasting results. If you want to see something that's going to last, it's going to take some time to build that. Yeah. Um, just from my own personal background and experience, um, for 24 years of my life, I carried a gun. I think you all probably know that by now. I spent eight years in the Marines. I was 15 years as a federal agent. I was in all kind of, I, I trained for 24 different years in, in my life. Uh, with a weapon, okay? I would say I'm, I'm pretty proficient with that weapon system, okay? Whether it's a pistol or a rifle. But when I first started out, I knew nothing. And so I got my training in the Marine Corps, and then later on I uh, moved up to when I was a federal agent, and I went through a whole bunch of training. But a lot of times when people look at these high-speed military units, they think, well, they must be jumping out of helicopters and doing all this high-speed stuff. But really what it is, and Paul is probably going to laugh because it's called brilliance in the basics. Brilliance in the basics. It's doing the little things right. Repetition over time is how you get good at anything. Yeah. It doesn't happen. It's not a flash in a pan. And so as they say it takes uh, 10,000 repetitions for something to become muscle memory. Okay? And so it's not, a, it's not an overnight thing. It's just a small little thing that you do on a daily basis. Just like um, reading your Bible, prayer, coming to church, coming to Sunday school, trying to learn little by little. And those things over time, as a collection, they begin to grow the Christian. It's not just a flash in the pan, folks. It's going to take some time. It's not just the big, the big meetings that you should be looking for. We talk about revival all the time. And I say, well, listen, if you would just do the little things right, little things right, 
you'd be surprised at what kind of revival that would, that would put in your life. Amen. Because guess what? Amen. When you read this book, it does something to you. Yes. It's not just the high-flying, high-emotional experiences, and those are all well and good. Those are great. Those are the mountaintop experiences. But where do you grow at? You grow down in the valley. And down in the valley is where you're going to have to get close to this book because you're going to have to lean on something more than just your emotion. And so, yes, I'm big on Bible reading. I'm big on prayer. I'm big on all those things because that is what's going to make you grow as a Christian. So don't get caught up in some of the high-flying things that are out there. It's just uh, this simple, just the little things. That's Seemingly, that's boring. Uh, We used to have a guy that would always harp on dry firing your pistol. Okay, drawn from the holster, dry fire your pistol. Because pistol shooting is a lot harder than rifle shooting. Why? Because the barrel's shorter. There's a lot more room for mistake when you're shooting a pistol. Okay? You can be off a little bit with a rifle, but if you're off with a pistol, it's gonna it's gonna go right, it's gonna go left, it's gonna go everywhere, and then they're gonna blame the gun, because that's what they always do. But it really what it has to do with is the shooter. And you have to be really finite when you're pulling that trigger. Okay, and squeezing that thing to the rear and letting that thing go off and surprise you, but you, you get good through dry firing. Just repetition. Repet- stand in front of the mirror and dry fire. Boom. Over and over and over. And what that does is that creates that muscle memory, so when you have to pull that thing out for real and use it, guess what? You have that stored in your memory bank, so when you go out there to witness to somebody and you've been putting this thing right here, this old 1611 in your, in your heart, and you go to witness to somebody, hopefully out there, not just in here, guess what comes out? The book. Out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. And that's the only way that you're going to defeat your enemy, by the way, because the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing he said to the devil was, it is written. It is written. It is written. You think there was a Bible around in that 40 days when the Lord was being tempted? Where was it? He hid it in his heart. It's like David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Right. You see many a man that were taken off because there might come a day when you don't have a Bible. You, if you study, uh, look at uh, Richard Wormbrandt. When he was taken off the communist prison, he went in there and he didn't have a Bible. But you know where it was? It was here. He memorized it. Because there came a day when he no longer had a Bible. You might think that that's just a little thing, just scripture memorization. We see children get up here all the time. Well, what if we had to put some adults up here? Could you memorize something more than just Jesus wept? I mean, it's just a little thing, right? Just a little thing. Read your Bible. If I was to take a show of hands right now and I was to, I was to ask and don't do it, but if I was to ask how many Christians have read their Bible from Genesis to Revelation since they've been saved? How many people could not raise their hand? I I, I dare say there's probably many of people that could not raise their hand. I knew there's a brother that he started a church up in Detroit, Michigan. He did five years in federal penitentiary for drug charges. He said that before he went to prison, he read his Bible through 30 times. King James Bible, 30 times before he was ever saved. He got saved in prison. Okay, now he pastors a church in Detroit because uh, black folks wouldn't come to a, to a white church. So God said, all right, you start a church in Detroit. So he started a Bible-believing work in Detroit, Michigan. But that brother up there is flourishing right now. But it, I, it amazed me that he said, I've read the Bible 30 times through before I ever went to prison. I thought, man, you're a slow learner. It took you that long to get saved. <laughs> but, but you understand my point. There was a lost man reading this Bible more than some Christians do. We wonder why we're in the mess that we're in. Once again, you better quit looking outward, look inward. Little things, little things, small things, reading the Bible, prayer, just those little small things. Look at back at the text. He says this. He says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Why does he say it twice? He says it twice to slow you down. Small, slow. Remember he says in Zechariah, For who hath despised the day of small things? Small, slow, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. I was, uh, I've been asked a few times about uh, when are we going to get to Revelation? I've mentioned possibly, if Lord wills it, we'll teach Revelation. Lord wills it. 
Okay? When are we going to get there? I said, my answer doesn't change when we finish Romans. Well, how, how long is that going to be? I have no idea. There's a lot of things to get through in Romans. See, nowadays, people want to get ahead. Yeah. They want to jump to the back of the book. Yeah. They just want the Reader's Digest version of what the Bible says. And there's a method to the madness of teaching Romans before going to Revelation. Yeah. Because if you don't have Romans and the Pauline doctrine laid down for the church, you don't have any business going over here to Revelation. Because there's going to be things in Revelation that are going to, they're going to mess you up if you don't have your doctrine straight in Romans. But today everybody just wants at the click of a finger, at the click of a button, they just, they just Google everything. That's not how God works. That's not how God grows Christians. He grows them small things and he slowly grows them. If I were to take a plant and I were to plant the thing in the ground and I was to dump a bunch of fertilizer on that plant, what would happen to that plant? It would kill it. It would burn it up. Same thing if I watered that, if I overwatered that plant, I would drown that plant out. Well, Christians are likened to trees and other plants and things like that in the scripture. Well, if I was to take you and just dump all this information on you, what would happen is that you would get a head full of knowledge and you get burnt up real fast and you get burnt out. Because that's not God's way of doing things. But we're impatient, aren't we? We want it here, we want it fast, we want it now. But that is not the way the Lord does things. He does them slow, he does them small, he does them slow. James says, let patience have her perfect work. It's a hard thing to be patient, isn't it? It's a hard thing to wait on God. You say, I want to know this, I want to know that. that's good. That's good to be zealously affected in a good thing, but you're going to have to give it some time. You're not going to sit there and learn this book in one sitting. He said line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. It's going to take some, guess what? It's going to take some repetition. He's going to do it slowly, and it's going to be at your own pace. He's not going to, he's not going to have you grow faster than you are able to grow. That's common sense. Some people have more grace to understand things than others do. But that doesn't make them better as we went over this morning in Sunday school. But they, everybody has to grow at their pace. But it's up to you on, on how much that you want to grow. You want to grow, grow as a Christian? Get in the book. One time I sat back, he doesn't remember it now. I sat back there and a long time ago, probably eight years ago, I first started preaching. I asked pastor, I said, pastor, I was reading about Dwight L. Moody and the anointing and all that stuff. All young preachers get into that. Oh, I want the anointing, you know. And just, they think it's going to be some big, you know, lightning bolt from the sky. And, and I said, how do you, you know, asking about the anointing. He said to me, get in the book. That's what he said. I said, okay. I was already in the book. I got in the book more. All right. But over a process of time, the Lord had shown me things and, and helped me along the way and helped me to learn this Bible, not that I know everything, folks. Nobody knows everything. No. Nobody knows everything in this book. There's passages in this book that nobody has figured out. Amen. But Amen. over a process of time, he, was, he taught me things about this Bible, about the doctrines in it and the importance of it. And I'm so very thankful for the Lord that he saved me, called me out from what I used to be, and brought me to where I am now. And I'm able to stand up here and teach other people the Bible, which blows my mind. Because I know where I came from. But how'd that take place? Small, slow. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't read my Bible. Amen. I was hungry for the Word of God. Are you hungry for the Word of God? I asked that question. It's an open-ended question. But a lot of times Christians, I, used, I was stupid when I first got saved. I didn't know nothing. I didn't know what a dispensation was. I didn't, I, you know, I'd never heard that word in my life before. I didn't know anything. I was like, I was just green as that grass like preacher said. And, but I was hungry. I was a sponge. I wanted to learn some things. And so because of that, because of my hunger, God said, get in my book. And the Lord's pointing me here to Pastor Lawson. And here I sit. But the thing about it was, is it just didn't come overnight. It was a, it was a process that, I, that I, I look back at now and I say, okay, I see God's hand in that thing. But uh, you're not going to get it by sitting on your blessed assurance. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God. What, a workman 
that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the thing where people are not willing to put the work in. I talked to a young, or to, not to a young guy, he's older than me, but he was starting to get into hyper dispensationalism. I worked with him. And I said, he, he kept asking me a bunch of questions about the book of Acts. And he said, man, how do you know so much Bible? You know, he's from Kentucky. And, and uh, I said, uh, I said, all right. I started trying to answer some of his questions because I saw the path he was going down and he was not, it was not a good path, a path. So I said, well, this is the first commentary I ever read. The second I read Clarence Larkin, then I read Dr. Ruckman's uh, commentary in the book of Acts. And I so I bought it and sent it to him. A couple weeks later, I asked him, I said, hey, did you read that commentary? He said, man, that's a lot of Bible. I said, I said, yeah, it is. Right then I knew he was not willing to put the work in it took to learn doctrine out of this book. It's going to take some time, folks. It's going to, it's going to take a long time. If you're, but if you're willing to do it, God will give it to you. He will bless you if you, if you are hungry for the Word of God. Amen? So he does things slow. He does things small. Or small and slow. Lastly, he, or he, do, he does things steady. Notice he says this, here a little and there a little. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, if you will. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. Look at Proverbs 6, verse 6. Steady. He says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall they, so shall thy poverty come as one that, that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. So you've got a lazy man here compared with an ant. He says, consider the ant. What is about that ant? Well, it's steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You'll notice something about that ant. It does not need somebody telling it what to do all the time. Look at the text. He says, go to the ant. He says, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. You know what that, that law was to the Jew? It was to be their schoolmaster. They were the heirs, but they had that law constantly telling them what to do, where to go, where not to go. Today we're living in a time when the Holy Spirit resides within you. And if you've got the Holy Spirit within you, there ought to be some sort of hunger for the Word of God, and you should not have to be told to read your Bible. You should not be, have to be told to do those things because, listen, listen folks, that should be a no-brainer. This ant didn't need to be told. It took initiative, and it pressed toward the mark of the high prize of God in Christ Jesus, the calling of God in Christ Jesus. She was looking at a mark, and she was heading towards that thing. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ, he set his face like a flint. He was doing everything to the will of the Father. And just like this ant, if you took an ant and it's going along here, and if I put an obstacle in front of it, you know what it's going to do? It's either going to go around it, it's going to go over it, but it's going, to, it's going to continue on its present course. And nobody's going to have to tell that ant what to do. She's steadfast. She's immovable. She's always abounding in the work of the Lord. Notice this also in the text. Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. She gathers that food when she can. She's not waiting for the winter to come because as Paul told Timothy, he said, come before winter. Why is that? Because when winter comes, you can no longer work. Whatever you could do for the Lord down here, it's summertime. There's a harvest. So whatever you can do for God, you better do it now. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter five. Look at the text Paul puts down. Ephesians chapter five, look how this matches up. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from, de from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that she walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Notice the ant, she's wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. He says, redeeming the time for the days are evil. There's coming a day that winter's going to come. And if you don't gather that food when you can, there's not going to be any chance left. See, there's coming a day that you're going to go up before the judgment seat of Christ. And that work that you could have done, you're done. Winter's here. 
You're up at the judgment seat of Christ and the things that you could have did for, did for Jesus Christ is no longer a chance. And you're going to wish that, I wish I could have did more. I wish I could have studied my Bible more. I wish I could have prayed more. I wish I could have witnessed more. But it's over. Winter's come. So like that ant, she need, you need to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Just like that tree that's planted by the rivers of water in Psalm 1, she's going to bring forth her fruit in due season. Well, Paul said, if you faint not, you shall, you shall also re reap. If you faint not. But the problem today is people, what, what kills Christians the most is routine duty. It's the little, it's the small things. It's the slow things. It's the steadfastness. That is what kills Christians. Because you get tired of just that daily grind. Did you know the Bible's written like your life? Anybody love reading 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 8? Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you've read your Bible, you understand you get through 1 Chronicles and it's just name after name after name after name and you can't pronounce none of those names. Uh, the only one I could, Scorby, I think, could pronounce all of them. I don't know how he did that. But you get through them names, you say, man, you get through 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 8, you say, thank God. I can start reading something else I can understand again. Anybody? Am I the only one? Okay. So you get into 1 Chronicles and Ezra and some of those other uh, pages of the Word of God, but he said, but man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. What's God doing? He's testing your character. Are you going to read that name? Or are you going to skip over it? I read all the Bible. Did you read all those names? You going to lie in church? friend of mine, he was down there, and uh, he was going to PBI down in Pensacola, and he was going on visitation, and he went out and knocked on the lady's door, and, and, and she said, young man, have you read your Bible from cover to cover? He said, at the time he had not, he, he said, what'd you do? He said, well, I lied. He said, yeah. I mean, how's that for a preacher to say, yeah, I mean, this lady's putting him on the spot. Well, yeah, I've read it cover to cover, and he had not. Taught him something, though, didn't it? Holy Ghost got on to him. I said, yeah, that's right. You're a preacher. Why haven't you read your Bible from cover to cover? Amen. Character. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. Even the boring stuff, even the boring stuff. When you start reading about the, in, in the book of Numbers, you start going through those things and the, the candlesticks and the spoons and so on, and you're like, man. And it's repetition, 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 repetition. What's he doing? He's testing your character. Are you going to continue on or are you going to quit? That's, I know that's boring, right? It is, but it's not. God's testing you. And if you'll push through those things, God will give you something on the end of that. If you have the character to push through. So they're steadfast and movable. He says redeeming the time. So when, when you have the time, you better make best use of that time. I spent 34 years of my life serving the flesh and the devil. So after I got saved, I was going to make sure that I was going to redeem the time, the time that I do have left on this earth to glorify the Lord and not my flesh, the world, and the devil. Now, I'm not saying I'm 100%. I don't, nobody bats a thousand. But listen, you better take the time that you have. I tell some young guys, if they ask me about going to school, not everybody's got to go to school. I understand that if you're a preacher. But if you have the time and you don't have a wife and you don't have kids and you don't have all the other distractions and you want to learn the Bible, then you better... You better use that time accordingly because there may come a time, guess what, when you don't have the time that you used to have. That's just life. Amen? Amen. So if you have that time, God's called you to do that, go do it. Do it when you can. Don't wait for the winter to come. So we see that. We see this small, slow, steady. And that process, folks, that process that God puts you through, it produces a product. What that product is, is a balanced Christian. He's not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Do you understand how to rightly divide the word of truth? You can understand truth from error, okay? You can understand certain things uh, as far as uh, not just doctrinal things, but having a balance in your life is important because like Paul got onto the Corinthians because they were out of balance. Well, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. And so the problem with the Corinthians was that they were extreme in one way or another. 
You had those on this side that were ready to divorce their wives and leave their masters and, and do all the things you know, just, just so they could be like Paul. Because they wanted to run out there and be just like Paul. Paul said, abide where, you, where you've been called. Stay where you're at. If you're married, don't be divorced. Just, just because Paul was single doesn't mean you have to go be like Paul. Okay, if you're a slave, okay, you're under your master's yoke, remain a slave. Serve God where you can. Boy, that's, <laughs> you talk about Christianity. And then on the other side of that, the Corinthians, you had a bunch, you had all the liberals. They thought they were spiritual because they wouldn't judge sin. So there was no balance in Corinth, and that was the problem. That's why Paul's rebuking Corinth, because there's no balance. There ought to be balance. When you see some of these hyper and these extreme movements, it's because they lack balance. Okay, I talked about hyper-dispensationalism uh, earlier. You got hyper-Calvinism. You got all kind of hyper-movements. What that comes from is not having a balance in the Bible. Okay, not being able to rightly divide the word of truth. Not being able to lay down as far as applications of Scripture that we go over and over and over and over. Okay, and what that produces is an unbalanced Christian. An unbalanced Christian is no good. Because why? It's all about themselves. It's all about look at me, look at me, look at me. But listen, folks, a, a balanced Christian is going to be able to judge things based off the Word of God and is going to have some discernment about things from the book. And it's going to keep you out of a lot of hot water and a lot of trouble in your life. I can think of things and I can, I can look at certain situations that I looked at and I said, hmm, there it is. I see that in the Word of God. Thank God I read the Bible and it kept me from this or kept me from that. I, I, I hear little things that uh, creep into the church and I start listening to little things that people will say it'll key me into certain things about maybe, they're, maybe they are Calvinists or maybe they're hyper-dispensationalists or whatever the heresy might be and you'd be surprised at how much that stuff creeps into the churches. That's pastor's job. He sees those things. He deals with those things. But all that comes from is being balanced and understanding, listen, you've got to get in this book and you cannot be too extreme one way or the other. Where it's going it's to drive you into a strange and diverse doctrines, as Paul calls it in Hebrews 13. And your heart's not going to be established with grace, and, nobody, and you're just going to be tinkling cymbals and sounding brass. Amen. And that's, that's, that's what that stuff turns into, and it's just a bunch of head knowledge. Amen. So you've got to get out there, and you've got to, if you get in this book, get out there and soul win. Get out there and try to pass out tracts and witness the people. Do what you can while you can. Because it'll keep you balanced. It'll keep you grounded. Because guess what? You're going to deal with real people. And they got real problems. And you can't just throw a bunch of Bible verses at them. You're going to have to deal with them and minister to them where they're at. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get through this message here. But there's some things that God is trying to give you as far as doctrine. How he, how he wants you to grow. So you got a balanced Christian. There's the product it produces. He's not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Much like that that uh, palm tree. If you ever notice a palm tree, all these hurricanes going on, what's left at the end of it? Palm trees. You know, the Syrian palm tree takes between six to eight to ten years to be able to produce fruit. Much like the Christian. It takes a little time for that Christian, that babe in Christ, to grow enough to where it can start to produce fruit to where somebody can actually eat what, it's, what they're putting out. Look at Psalm 92 and we'll... We'll get close to uh, f finishing up here. Look at Psalm 92. Look at verse 12. Psalm 92, 12 says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Notice what I said earlier about small little inputs over a long period of time produce a lasting product, produce a lasting Christian. Notice Caleb in the Old Testament. He still continued to produce fruit in his old age. Yes, Why? Because he was rooted. He was grounded. He wasn't tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You see those things that Paul lays down, you see those things in the Old Testament but that's where you want to be. In your old age, if you've got the right foundation laid down, which is Jesus Christ, then the apostles, then the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those things that God gave us as gifts to the church, listen, the doctrines of the Bible, if you have those down rooted in your heart, you're not going to be fooled, and you're going to continue to produce in your older age. Just like that palm tree. And it's going to grow up straight. It's not going to, it's, it's going to be lasting. After the winds come and the hail and everything else, that palm tree still stands. Because she's got a root system that you cannot just pull up easily. 
and she's got a crown on her head, and that crown has fruit in it. Amen? So that's where you want to look at as far as what I want to become as a Christian. I want to be rooted and grounded. I want to be able to be long-lasting. I don't want to just be a flash in the pan. Amen? So with that product comes peace. You've got stability in the storm. Rooted and grounded in love, you've got stability when the storm comes. When the winds blow and the rocks rent and your house is, is founded upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about when things take place around you, you have that peace which passeth all understanding. If your doctrine is right, you don't care that the world's falling apart around you. Yes, you care, but the inner man says, okay, the worst thing that can happen to me is I'll die. What happens after that? I go to heaven. To be absent with the body is present with the Lord. Amen. When all this stuff was going around a couple years ago with COVID, everybody was, you start hearing all these things from, from Christians talking about, oh, the COVID-19 vaccine, that thing's the mark of the beast. I said, no, it's not. How could it be? If it could, if it, if it could be the mark of the beast, guess what? That means a part of the body of Christ, if you could take it, could go to hell. That's not possible. Christ already took hell on the cross, all the hell for eternity, past, present, future. In a matter of about three hours, he took it on the cross. And he went down to hell and the flames never touched him because he had already taken it on the cross. So guess what? If you could take the mark, that means you as the church, a part of the body of Christ, could go to hell. So... You're not worried about it. Why? Because your doctrine's straight. I'm not worried about going into the tribulation. Why? Because you're not appointed under wrath, but to obtain salvation. Paul said, comfort one another with these words. He said that right after he told the Thessalonians about the rapture. Amen. Comfort one another. It gives you peace. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound, sound mind. So therefore, when those things come and you start hearing that stuff in your ears, you know what? You say, I've got peace about it. Why? Because I know where I'm going. I've got the spirit of prophecy. I know where I'm going when I die. I know how the whole thing ends up. I've read Revelation 22. We win. So if I get vaporized in a nuclear blast, well, praise the Lord. I'm going up. To be absent from the bodies, to be present from the Lord. And if you can have that mindset and your doctrines are straight, you're not going to be scared when things come around. See, Dev, Satan wants to get you there. He wants to paralyze you with that kind of fear so you're afraid to do anything. So you'll just huddle up and won't come out and won't do anything. We just saw that, didn't we? All right? But if you have your doctrine straight, you don't have to worry about those things. Yes, you might suffer some tribulation in this life, but you're not going to the great tribulation. You're not going to the Daniel 70th week. That's for somebody else. Thank God for that. So lastly, in conclusion, get in the book, please. Understand your Bible, read your Bible, study over it, pray over it. Just do the little things right. Just the little things. Quit looking for all the big things. And we'd love to see a big revival. Yes, we would. But if you would just do individually what you're supposed to do as a Christian, if you would just study, pray, pass out tracts, witness to people, you'd be amazed at how you could change the world. I'll end with this. One time I was preaching on the street corner down here in Gay Street. And I was preaching and I kept looking at a guy. He was, and you could tell, and he's making eye contact with me and he's listening to every word I'm preaching. So as soon as I got done preaching, and there was two homeless guys behind me, and one of the guys I dealt with many times at Carm, so I knew him, but the other guy was cursing at me the whole time. He was mad and it brings out the devils. It's a good time. So I was looking at this guy over here and I got done, and I went over, and I said, hey, how you doing? I introduced myself. He said, I just appreciate what you're doing. He said, these guys are always hanging out on this, on this corner right here. He said, uh, but, you know, your preaching made them leave. I thought to myself, man, if only we had some street preachers on every corner in America, how would that clean up some of these cities that are full of filth? and vagrancy and everything else. Yeah. Boy, I'll tell you what, the, the Word of God is quick and powerful. But you know what? Ah, that stuff doesn't work anymore. Ah, that we used to do those things. I'll tell you what, it worked that day. If it's not gonna, if it's not gonna get them saved, at least it'll, it'll get them moving. And that man appreciated that. And I, and I thought about that and I said, man, if we just had more Christians, just do what they're supposed to do. 
not going out there trying to change foreign policy. You're not going to change foreign policy by preaching on the street or passing a track out. But you might save a soul from hell. You might plant a seed. We just had three that were saved. What was it yesterday? Obedience. Little thing. Just little things. All right, let's end there. Father, Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Just pray for the words that went out, Lord. I know that they will not return unto you void, but they will accomplish that which you please. And Father, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for calling me. I thank you for this church and this ministry, Lord. I just pray that something that was said will stick with somebody and it'll cause them to get in the, in the word more and to get on fire for you. Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. That's good. Yes, sir. I, he gives you a lot of Bible. A lot of Bible. That's good. Let's stand up tonight. Folks, the scripture will talk to you. And what I told you this morning, two people can read the same scripture and they'll get entirely different messages from God. Not that the scripture says something different, but what God says to you may be different because he'll talk to you from his word. What have we got, brother? Page 354, I surrender all. Amen. These men are going out here preaching on the street and three were saved yesterday. Now that's a big deal, folks. This is God blessing his word. Amen. Thank God for them. Pray for them as they go out. If the Lord moves upon your heart, um, Brother Sam Green over here talked to me the other day about this. We've been praying about it. And if, uh, especially a young man, now we don't want any women out there, but you can, you can hand out tracts, but we don't want you preaching. You preach at home. Amen. <laughs> but not out on the street uh, but uh, this is a good thing uh, I grew up in Knoxville how many of you remember the old market house in market where the market square when I was five years old six years old you could go up there and they would be standing on the corners next to that old market house preaching the word of God I remember that I'll never forget that's a long time ago so that's a good place to preach, but a lot of other places to preach too. When a man says that God's called me to preach, but I don't have anywhere to preach, you don't know who you're talking to here now. <laughs> Listen, there's all kinds of places to preach. If you want to preach, you can preach, and God will give you a place. So pray about that, and, and, uh, and pray for our brother here and the ministry they've got. And, and uh, brother here has always uh, been, been involved in, in evangelism and outside the church and outside preaching the word of God. And I thank God for it. Amen. The Bible said, by the foolishness of teaching, God saved them that believe. See, the head's shaking. I'm glad you caught me. What's it say? By the foolishness of preaching. Amen. He saves those that believe. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's sing one more verse. And if you had like to come down here... And, and dedicate your life to the Lord. Tell him that you're going to spend the rest of your life in this world living for him. You can do that. Do it now. All right, brother, go ahead.
pray for the, uh, the ministry. Now, this brother teaches Sunday school, the auditorium class here, every Sunday. And not only that, but you can get on the YouTube page, the church page, and all of the Sunday school lessons are posted on there that you can pick them up there if you can't make it here. And all this material is out there and it's available. And I'd, I'd use it if I could, possibly. If you need some study, someone to help you, help you get started, uh, he'll do a good job of it. Amen. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. We'll meet again Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for a prayer meeting. And we'd like to invite you next week. Brother Cody Shue will be with us. Don't forget Tammy Garcia. Please pray that God give her traveling mercies out to California. It'll be a rough trip, folks. This is her son. A rough trip. Pray that God will bless her as she travels there and back. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the time we've had in your house today. Lord, we pray that you bless your word. It's your word that's powerful, all powerful. It's quick and powerful. And we pray you'd bless it as it goes out. May people with ears to hear, let them hear it. May they receive it into their heart, not their head. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.